don't forget to do it later. Uh, Paul, our son-in-law will have his appendectomy on Friday morning. I talked to uh, Jenny and Frank this afternoon and her father is doing a little better today. So that's, that's a good report. Uh, Bobby, uh, let's see, Bobby Rollins is at the hospital at St. Mary's. He's having a few kidney problems again. So they're working on his kidney problems. Dean Burkhead is in the ICU at uh, St. Mary's. Uh, they did not put him on a ventilator. He came close to it, and then he improved before morning. And uh, so he did not have to go on to the ventilator. So maybe the antibiotics are starting to work. And so just, just keep prayers up for he and Janice. And I know that uh, their son and daughter-in-law are on their way over th uh, this evening from Mississippi. So they'll soon have some extra help around. What else? That's enough. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I haven't heard of more unless y'all know of others at the moment. <laughs> All right, we're going to start with a prayer. How about that? Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we continue to ask your intercession and your healing grace to be upon these that we've named out loud. They so much need your uh, healing touch, your presence, and those who uh, love and attend them, Lord, we just ask your uh, grace and peace to be with them as well as they go through these trials. Uh, we're, we're thankful that... Uh, uh, Sandra Rollins got to come home from the hospital and is doing better again. I know uh, she's in some pain, so we pray for her. We pray for those waiting on surgery, like my son-in-law and others who uh, have procedures scheduled. We know that uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, uh, Barbara, let's, I get all my Barbara's mixed up. Hi, <laughs> sir. Uh, yes, Barbara Pfeiffer will have, have a surgery, so we, we pray for her. And uh, Lord, there is much concern about this virus and the, uh, the pandemic, about uh, what we should do to continue to be safe. And we just ask you to continue to grant wisdom to us as we go along. Uh, give us your protection and care. And as we study tonight, let your spirit move uh, amongst us as we study in your word that we might incorporate it into our living, grow in your love, and become more like you. We ask for your forgiveness for our sins and uh, for your guidance. Let your spirit guide us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. What's going on with Barbara? She, she is going to have some surgery. Barbara Pfeiffer is going to have some surgery. She, she asked that I not... Uh, dote on it or <laughs> share, share the information around, but uh, just that we pray for her. All right. Where did I leave off? Was it right at the beginning of chapter five of First John? That's what I've got. Okay, that's where I think we are. I left my other Bible in the, in the van, and so I had to pull another one off the shelf, and I didn't have a place mark here. Well, we're just about to wrap up First John, and uh, we'll we'll move on from there. Suffice it to say, we, I just just a reminder that part of the reason that John has written this letter again is that there is a heresy at work within the church. The church has been split uh, by people who come in, people that he has called antichrists. Uh, they're they're bringing uh, doctrine that doesn't match the story of uh, the gospel story of Jesus. Uh, they're trying to get people to believe uh, different things about Jesus, which uh, are, are not, uh, <laughs> I'll just say kosher. They, they, they are not the same beliefs that we, we believe. 
and they're leading people astray. And uh, John is trying to get us back on the right track. And one of the proofs, he says, of uh, being uh, one of the ones that has the right doctrine is that you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not only that, uh, you live in his love. Those are, those are kind of the two big proofs that he's held out for us. Uh, because if you, if you will say Jesus is Lord and that uh, he is uh, sent from God to save us, uh, then, then you have the right doctrine. And if you live in God's love, in, instead of hating your brothers and sisters, uh, then truly uh, you, you've got the message right. Uh, so this, this is meant to distinguish between those who are sowing discord and trouble within the church. And, and that's probably good advice anytime that there's discord within the church. Uh, if, if people won't focus on Jesus and, and people are intent on stirring up hate and, uh, within the church, uh, they're, they're not of Christ. We, we need to uh, separate the, the sheep from the goats, as it were. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about faith in Christ, beginning at chapter 5, verse 1. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. Okay, again, this is kind of a reinforcement in so many words of what he has already been telling them, but uh, just to drive home the point again. Verse 2, this is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. Okay, so the proof's in the pudding, in other words. Uh, if you say you love, but you don't have it within you, and you're not keeping God's commands, well, you've, you've missed the mark. You're shooting at the wrong target. Verse 3, this is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. Now, that's, that's an interesting statement because uh, the world encompasses so much. But what, what, do you think he's, what do you think he's getting at here by saying overcoming the world? What, what does the world have that doesn't speak of Christ? What, what, what is it that, uh, you know, we've got to overcome as Christians? Not going along with the worldly, worldly uh, priorities rather than God. Okay, well, I I agree with that. I mean, if we're if we're not following God's commands and we're doing whatever everybody else is doing, we're of the world, right? right. Yeah, and, and to overcome the world would be to be obedient to God, to stay with His commands, and uh, you know ignore the trouble and temptation and uh, the fightings that this world so often uh, falls prey to. Okay. So he's kind of given us some, some reiteration here in so many, in so many ways. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. So now he's going to connect faith to obedience here, because if we have faith, if we truly believe in God, and we believe that Jesus is the Christ, we're going to obey his commands. And so this is not burdensome, he says, but our faith helps us overcome the world because we become obedient to God. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. Now, he can't come back to this too much, it seems, in First John. He just, he, every other sentence or scripture he's come right back to this point about believing in jesus christ this seems to be the biggest problem uh, that there is with this split within the church and again there's a gnostic heresy docetism is coming along people are trying to figure out what's the right way to uh follow god and, and basically john is taking us back to the gospel message He's taking us back to what he wrote and the other gospel writers wrote about who Jesus was, the witness that the gospels give us, and not only that, what, what Jesus' commands were. How did he live out his life and love? How did he overcome the world? <laughs> All right. Verse 6. This is the one who came by water 
and blood, Jesus Christ. All right. Now, what do you what do you think he's getting at by this water and blood business here? He was alive. Yeah, I'll agree with that, Bobby. He 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 uh, he was born of water, like all babies are. He he was flesh and blood, and and I think that you're right. This this could refer to his baptism and the sacrifice that uh, he made that we celebrate in Holy Communion, but I don't think that's where this author is going here. If his main point here is to say that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus was flesh and blood, then he's trying to help us understand. He was born, uh, he died, uh, his blood flowed on that cross, it was real. Uh, this, you know, this is another confirmation uh, from the Gospels about the truth. Uh, of their witness of Jesus Christ. So I, Bobby, you get an A tonight. That's a, that's, you hit the nail on the head right there, I think. <laughs> All right. And it is the spirit who testifies because the spirit is the truth. Okay, we know the spirit witnesses to the truth. It's a guide, it's a counselor. Uh, it tells us the things of God. And, and he's saying here, if we've got the spirit, the spirit is testifying to these things. Uh, if somebody denies the Christ, well, they don't have the spirit. They're not listening to the witness of the spirit. All right. Now, verse seven is a kind of a controversial verse because it's stated one way here, uh, verse seven and eight. And then there's, I've got a footnote in my Bible that gives an alternative interpretation of it. It says, for there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now, you can take that as it's written there as, as kind of a reaffirmation of what he just said in verse six, coming by water and the blood. And he's talked about the spirit, so he, he, he pulls it back together in, in verses seven and eight and says, the spirit is the witness, it tells the truth, the water and the blood both testify to his humanity. Now, I've, I've got uh, a footnote here that says that the late manuscripts of the Vulgate say there are three witnesses that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't say that either one of those translations is wrong. I think that the one that I've got printed in my NIV is a good is a good one because when we talk about the spirit and the blood and the water, it, it's a follow through of what he's already said, starting at verse six. But I wouldn't deny what uh, it says, you know, in the Vulgate about the testimony of the Father, and you can say the Son and the Holy Spirit, because it says the word there. It means the logos, just like John wrote in his gospel. I don't think either. Either, either would be wrong, but certainly uh, what, what the NIV has got here and, and what uh, is translated uh, from the Greek is, is a good translation as well, I think, because it, uh, it, it doesn't bounce back and, and somehow or another uh, make, make void what was already said here. Any, any thoughts on that? Okay. Verse nine, we accept man's testimony. Okay. That's a given, but God's testimony is greater because it's the testimony of God, which he has given about his son. Okay. So some people's testimony isn't very good. People make things up, but God isn't God's of the truth and his testimony is greater than that of people. Verse 10, anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Okay, well, why do they have that testimony in their heart? Well, they've got the Spirit. The Spirit tells the truth. That's, that's, that's why they are of God. Anyone who does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his Son. All right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reread for you 
John 3, 16 and 17, because that sure sounds a whole lot like what we start getting into right here. Uh, let me, let me go ahead and read verse 11 first. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his son. Okay, now, listen again to John's gospel. It comes in a little bit of reversed order, but for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Now, I think that all of those verses are basically saying some of the same stuff right here. He's talking about calling God a liar if you don't believe, uh, and, and certainly Jesus is uh, telling us in John's gospel that uh, when, when uh, we don't believe and we don't listen to what the Spirit has to say, we're condemned already because we haven't believed in the one that God has sent. So I, I don't think that there's any difference in what's being said. It's just in different words here. Verse 12 of John's God, uh, first, first John 5, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Okay, that's, that's a pretty simple equation right there. You got the Son, you got life. You don't have the Son, no life. Because the life is only in him. Verse 13. Now he's going to give us his reasoning. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, he just wants to confirm to us. You believe in Jesus, you're, you're living according to the commands, uh, you're, you're following. Well, no, you've got eternal life. That's what's already been promised in, in John's gospel and the other gospels. And he says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. All right. So if you're asking God according to his will and you believe in Jesus, the son, God hears your prayers. And whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him. All of that's conditional, of course, on being being according to God's will. And again, most of the time when we think about prayer, we think about our laundry list of things that we want. But often we don't ask God first what we should ask for. And uh, if you want to ask according to God's will, then stop and let him speak to you a little bit. And, and that's going to help you. And, and not only that, God wants to answer those prayers. All right, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother commit a sin that does not lead to death, he should pray and God will give him life. I refer to those whose sin does not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I'm not saying that he should pray about that. All wrongdoing is sin. And there is sin that does not lead to death. Now he sure... <laughs> He got off. He got off in the bog when he wrote that because he didn't define his terms very good. Okay, I, I I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to straighten that out for you because I don't. I'll probably get in the bog with it too. If if anybody wants to enlighten us as to what sin what sin doesn't lead to death, uh, and start making a list, well, help yourself. But certainly. I think, I think based on his letter, I will say this, that the sin that is leading to death that he is speaking about here is certainly connected to this warning he's given the church about denying the Christ. Uh, because when we deny the Holy Spirit and, and the witness of the Spirit, you remember Jesus having that confrontation in John's gospel 
with with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, and they were they were claiming that Beelzebub was doing the miracles and Jesus was doing it in Beelzebub's name when they were trying to trying to deny the miracles. And that's at that moment that that Jesus said, "Well, there is a sin that's not going to be forgiven. Well, that'd be a sin that leads to death, wouldn't it?" And so, I th yes. I have written down here, Exodus 23, 21 says, to rebel against God is not forgiven. I agree. I agree. And I think that's exactly what John is talking about here. There's people denying the Christ who know what God's spirit witness is true, but they will not. They're, they're, they're tearing the church up. They're like wolves who come in. And, and this is the stuff that isn't going to be forgiven. At least that's, that would be my take on this. Thoughts on this? This is just summation. Peggy, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, I've got my head down. So long as a man in his heart of hearts hates sin and hates himself for sinning, so long as he knows that he is sinning, he is never beyond repentance and therefore never beyond forgiveness. But once he begins to revel in sin and to make it the deliberate policy of his life, he is on the way to death. Or he is on the way to a state where the idea of repentance will not and cannot enter his head. Wow. <laughs> I, I like the way that's written out. And that surely, that surely describes the state of these people who deny the Christ. Uh, the ones that Jesus confronted that, uh, you know, wanted to claim God's miracles were done by some demon. Uh, they, they were already dead. Verse 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe and the evil one cannot harm him. Now that's, that's nice. <laughs> it's it's nice to know that the devil is like that what peter wrote the like a lion going to and fro uh roaring trying to scare everybody but he, he doesn't have any real power to harm god's children we know that we are children of god and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one we know also that the son of god has come and given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. Isn't that an interesting way to end that book? Keep yourselves from idols. Uh, you got to wonder who, who and what they were lifting up as an alternative to Jesus, these ones who are denying the Christ, uh, there's, there is no telling. We don't, we don't even get a hint at it here. But it's, and it's not important to us, but anything can become an idol if we start loving it more than we love God. So I think that's a, that's a good way. It's kind of obscure, but it's a good way to, to end this teaching. Now, we have no idea whether 2 John and 3 John are written by the same author. We just know that they were compiled in, a, in another century. They circulated out there under the name of John. Could be, may not be the same writer that the, uh, of the one who wrote this epistle to us here. Uh, but because they lasted, uh, they were eventually canonized. In other words, they were determined to be uh, written under the inspiration of the Spirit, and they were included in these writings uh, that we're, we're reading tonight. And uh, and that goes for that goes for you know any of the the books that are in our Bibles. Uh, we just need to remember that there was a lot of other material that circulated to the churches, which ended up not being a part of our Bibles. Uh, and, and then again, as I've told some of you who've studied with me before, there are even books that were included in the, the canon 
that that were taken out <laughs> because uh, some of the, the uh, reformers didn't didn't like them. They thought they uh, too much supported uh, the Roman Catholic theology. Uh, so as as we as we study together, just know that uh, these have been accepted by the church uh, pretty much uh, from the get go. So Second John, verse one. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever. Okay, so this isn't so much a letter to the church as much as it is a private counsel, a letter written supposedly by John, who is the elder of the church, uh, writing to a specific family about some matter. So that, that's kind of the introduction here. We don't, we're not addressed by, by the same problem or the same uh, people uh, being addressed in this letter. And we, and we get this extra kind of flourish at the beginning, which isn't kind of John's style here. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. The Father, Son will be with us in truth and love. That's kind of just a little open opening blessing, you might say. Verse four, now we're going to get to the meat of the matter. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another, and this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands, as you have heard from the beginning. His command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world, and any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, that certainly doesn't uh, veer far off of what has been written in First John, does it? Verse eight, watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for, but that you may be fully rewarded. Now, I like that verse because when we talk about working out our salvation, that verse falls right in line and marches with it there because watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for. Well, what is that? Your salvation. Verse nine, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. You got to understand now, he's, he's warning right here against incorporating other doctrines, which aren't Christian doctrines, into their worship, uh, which is always a temptation. Uh, it, it's happened in the church and always will happen in the church. Uh, traditions enter in and suddenly get baptized and suddenly you have to do it this way because that's the way that we've done it for however long, or uh, it's it's hard to break old habits, and so you just bring them in with what you're doing, and they become kind of the norm. Uh, if if we don't stay with what is in the gospel, well, we've got trouble, especially if some of the things that we're, we're adding extra in uh, change the way that we worship. Now, Cindy and I have gone to Mexico on numerous occasions, and we've seen... Uh, some of the uh, belief of the Roman Catholic Church uh, in Latin America. And because the Latin American Roman Catholicism has incorporated or syncretized a lot of its religious belief along with some of the Indian ideas, the, the Native Americans who were there and some of their religion, now there's all kind of extra things that go on within the Catholic faith there that have nothing to do with the gospel. Uh, some, some of them seem harmless, of course, but some of them not so much. And, and the further you veer off the path and get you know, away from, from the, the main thing, well, the more likely you're gonna veer off more and, and get more things. And so when, when you go to one of these little towns in Mexico or another country down, down south of the border, I mean, there's religious festivals of all sorts going on. I mean, there's, there, you know, there's a parade every, every uh, week in many towns because 
that's just the way that it's done. Uh, they, we, we visited a little town called uh, Valladolid uh, down in central Yucatan a couple of years ago. And every day at noon, they had a parade. And we sat on the square and had lunch the days that we were there. And they had a parade that started and ended at the Catholic Church. Uh, and it was for the different tradespeople. Uh, and they would come and make this big hoopla and march around setting off fireworks, a band was playing. Uh, they had religious symbols they held in the air. Some of them were obscure. I didn't know what they were. They had to do with, I think, whatever saint you know, of their profession was. And uh, they would come and make their offering to the church. So if you were a plumber, you know, Wednesday of mid-November or something, you, you get to march back and forth to the church. Or if you're a carpenter, you get another day and et cetera and so on. And, uh, and then again, there's festivals for just like the Day of the Dead. Uh, that's, that seems close to what we have All Saints Day here. And they celebrated, of course, on October, October the 31st. But those beliefs that they have have nothing to do with Christian beliefs. Uh, they, they believe that the spirits of those ancestors of theirs come out of the grave for a couple of nights. And so they light candles and make little altars to their departed loved ones and uh, what's that got to do with the gospel i don't know but they they just you can see that once these ideas get ingrained there there they are and that's the way you do it and and it can lead you off on other paths uh so i think john is writing about similar kind of things happening here that uh you you can just you can be you need to be careful to keep to the gospel here Watch out that you do not lose what you've worked for. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So hold to the teaching, in other words. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Well, this poor woman, whoever he's writing to here, obviously has been hosting some of the people that have been denying the Christ or have brought some stuff into the church that didn't belong. So he's, he's warning her strictly. Don't do this anymore. Verse 11, anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. Now there's a threat. Verse 12, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that your joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. So this was like a personal note to somebody who's been having trouble, uh, is probably not completely square with the whole gospel and has been actively inviting people that he's been calling antichrists and dividers uh, in to in, in welcoming them into the church in their home. So I wouldn't say that's too far off the mark from first John but uh, certainly just personal advice from John, maybe. Okay, third John. Didn't take long to do second John, did it? <laughs> Again, they're just, these are notes, in other words, not really, not really epistle so much. The elder to my friend Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Verse two, dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and all that may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me, tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Dear friend, you are faithful in what you're doing for the brothers, even though they are strangers to you. They have told the church about your love. You will do well to send them on their way in a manner worthy of God. It was for the sake of the name, and there's a capital N on that name, we're talking about Jesus, that they went out receiving no help from the pagans. We ought therefore to show hospitality to such men so that we may work together for the truth. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first will have nothing to do with us. 
All right. <laughs> so, so now we get a little warning about this Diotrephes fella uh, who's got a big pride problem, ego problem. Verse 10. So if I come, I will call attention to what he's doing, gossiping maliciously about us. Not satisfied with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Well, this fella, he's a troublemaker. <laughs> he's doing the opposite of what he ought to be doing. And obviously, he's got power within the church, and that's the problem. He, he's, get, he's doing it, and he's kind of bullying over it, the people who are afraid to say anything. He's paying the bills. He, he may be. Uh-huh. But he's got the power, doesn't he? Okay. Dear friend, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. Anyone who does what is good is from God. Anyone who does what is evil is, has not seen God. Demetrius is well spoken of by everyone and even by the truth itself. We also speak well of him, and you know that our testimony is true. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to do so with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace to you. The friends here send their greetings. Greet the friends there by name. Well, that's a nice short letter, isn't it? so to speak. And we have no idea who, who exactly is getting this uh, letter or where they are, it, but it's just a, a general letter and we get a little, a little more insight about what, what happens in churches today isn't any different than what happens in churches back when John was going. Uh, what goes around comes around and people will always be people. Uh, They've got their problems and, and pridefulness and, and wanting to have the power is one of the big ones. Now we can take a, uh, unless there's questions, take a few minutes and talk about where we would like to go from here. We read the Gospel of John and then finished a few epistles uh, with John's name on them, which I think, you know, spoke well for uh, the Gospel. We can head off in whatever direction. It just depends on what y'all have an appetite for. Let's finish Jude. You want to finish Jude? It's not much bigger than John. Uh, yeah, I'm afraid I won't finish it tonight. I'm going to quit in about seven or eight minutes because I've got to walk across to choir practice. Uh, and wrap this up we can do that that's that's not a problem but uh we we need to we need to put our sights on a bigger target we need a bigger target <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to start an exploration of revelations i assume <laughs> bobby I'll, I'll i will bible study on any book in the bible Advent and Christmas coming up, could we just go to one of the Gospels and go through the birth and the, I don't know. The call. You want to go through one of the other Gospels, did you say? Well, I just said with Advent and Christmas coming on. Well, we could we go to the uh, Christmas story in uh, Matthew and Luke. I mean, we'll be hearing it in your sermons, I'm sure, too, but. Okay, would would you like to uh, focus on the Christmas story then? Up up until that I, time. I agree with her. Okay, I like that. That's that's a good place. We can kind of mix and match, and we can dive back into the Old Testament and pick up some of uh, what Isaiah and some of the other prophets have uh, spoken about uh, Emmanuel and uh, the the I guess the uh, foretelling of the Christ who is to come. You all want to want to do some of that and we'll dig around in the Christmas story a little bit. So which one would you start with or you'll just kind of go around? Uh, I think we can we can jump around a little bit. I mean we okay. can Matthew and Luke, is that what you said? 
yeah, Matthew and Luke have the Christmas story in pieces between them. Uh, but we can also go back into the Old Testament and pull back some scripture to, to read along with it that we we see being foretold uh, in the Gospels. I thought that'd be good. Okay. Well, we can we can do that. That that sounds like a plan to me. And uh, did y'all want to read a little of Jude first? Is that what is that what the idea was? We can read it at home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well. We We've got a plan, and we will we will start digging into it uh, next Wednesday. Then, hi. Uh, that'll be fun for me because we're we're singing Christmas music right now, and uh, we can we can just uh, delve all around. Be a little more work for you having to coordinate that's right. all that. That's all right. If, if y'all have some favorite scriptures or readings uh, for Advent, let me know, and we'll try to incorporate some of those and and see how they they tell back and forth uh, some of the things that are coming uh, as Jesus is being born. Georgiana, you look like you want to say something. No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, some somebody closes us out with prayer tonight. How about one of the ladies? Any lady. <laughs> I bet Shirley could do it. <laughs> <laughs> They're ganging up on you, Shirley. <laughs> I'm old for that. <laughs> it's unanimous, I think. <laughs> well, how was that for a forewarning there, Shirley? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be able to come to you through our electronic gadgets To, since we cannot meet face to face. We long for the day when we can meet together in person and be able to feel the sense of caring and love that we have. But in the meantime, we are thankful for the chance to at least do this. We also ask your blessing on those that have uh, are struggling with illnesses and health issues. Uh, guide them and, and give them the strength and courage to get through all of these things. We also ask for your forgiveness for the things that we do without even realizing what we're doing and help us to be more aware of the Holy Spirit in our lives to guide us to do your will. We ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. Hey, folks, uh, I will try to make a weather determination for Sunday uh, sometime by midday tomorrow. I just, I just, it's really close the way that the, the yes, sir. Call when that cold front's going to come through and bringing the rain with it. It's about a 50 50 chance right now that we'll be free or we'll get caught in thunderstorms on Sunday morning. So I'm, I'm trying to make the best call yet. So I'm, I haven't called it yet, but we will send out a text message and an email uh, sometime tomorrow afternoon to let everybody know kind of a final decision. Y'all stay safe, wear your mask, wash your hands, cancel yep. Thanksgiving plans. <laughs> Yeah, I've heard I, over the news that uh, uh, the the New York mayor they were had there was a Jewish synagogue that was protesting his uh, his oh, restrictions on the worship or something. Oh, right now. Uh, oh, oh, my, my son goodness. inherited. I do, I don't know. Did you check with the the vet in Darnell? I think I better stop the video. Okay. <laughs> good night, y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Have a good day tomorrow. You too. Bye -bye. I don't need it. And I don't.